Last time, we discussed a typology of environmental conflicts before discussing the roles of demographic and environmental stress, state capacity and institutional inclusiveness, dependence on rural livelihoods, and finally groupness as contextual factors that make it more likely competing claims over renewable resources will result in violent conflict. This time, we'll develop three mini case studies that illuminate the pathways by which these conflicts develop and escalate to violence. To illustrate distributive conflicts, we'll focus on the pokot turkana conflict in northwestern Kenya. To illustrate Sons of the Soil conflicts, we will focus on the Sri Lankan Civil War. And finally, to illustrate conflict to prevent environmental change, we'll focus on conflicts over land use changes and deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon. Let's start with distributive conflicts. Recall that distributive conflicts are conflicts between groups over who gets access to the resource. The most common type relates to communal conflict over usage rights to renewable resources like land, water, and the animals that graze on them and use those resources, like cattle. The pakat turkana conflict has been ongoing since 1995, with peaks in violence occurring in 1999, 2008, and 2015. This conflict is located in northwestern Kenya in the Turkana district, with some spillover into neighboring Uganda. The climate in the region is quite arid, roughly equivalent to the climate in Barstow, California. Barstow is not known for much, other than being a good place to gas up on the way to, or from, Las Vegas from Southern California. The climate is warm year-round and quite arid. Ground cover is mostly scrub brush, hardier weeds and grasses, and some cactus. That is, it's not exactly ideal for planting. It's not exactly ideal for herding, either, but nevertheless, that's the dominant livelihood in the region. For both the Pocat and Turkana, cattle and other grazing animals are the most important assets they have. The Pakat are an ethnic group composed mostly of pastoralists. Pastoralists are people who keep livestock and graze them across rangelands, living semi-nomadic lifestyles. They speak one of the dozen or so southern Nilotic, or originating in the southern Nile Basin, languages in Kenya. These women are from the Pokot tribe. The Turkana are an ethnic group also comprised, again, of mostly pastoralists who speak Turkana, an eastern Nilotic language. This older man and the boys you see in the picture are Turkana. The distinction between Southern and Eastern Nilotic is important because it helps us to know that these groups diverged linguistically and culturally several thousand years ago. This has a variety of implications, but one of the most important is that their common ancestry is effectively ancient history. Goats, camels, donkeys, and zebu, a type of cattle native to South Asia, are the primary herd stock utilized by the Pokot and Turkana peoples. In their societies, livestock functions not only as a milk or meat producer, but as a form of currency used for bride price negotiations and dowries. That is, it's a big part of how the societal transactions are conducted and how families are formed. Often, a young man will be given a single goat with which to start a herd, and he will accumulate more via animal husbandry, i.e. breeding them, and potentially by raiding or stealing from other herds. Livestock, especially cattle, are also very water-intensive, and in an arid environment, this means that access to the few seasonal rivers and streams in the region is key, as is access to boreholes and watering stations in the dry season. Her students have been quick in learning the art of marksmanship. <laughs> and what is supposedly a blood-curdling experience to many is turning out to be a jovial affair for this group of women who know too well that at least they can defend themselves if raiders strike. My curiosity drove me to try my hands on the weapon. Probably I would also find it fun to use it, as the girls did. Only to realize that this is no child's play. Raiding, or theft, between these two communities has occurred for many decades, if not centuries. But it has become far more lethal since the 1990s. The reasons are two. First, the end of the Cold War saw the massive weapons caches of Eastern Europe sold off in international arms markets, flooding those markets with Kalashnikov-style automatic rifles and other small arms. The technology of conflict is much more deadly now than when these encounters were fought with spears and arrows. And to be sure, they still are fought with spears and arrows in many instances. 
Second, and more recently, Kenyan organized crime has realized the economic value of cattle outside of the region and begun subsidizing the raiding activities and purchasing cattle for sale in more urban markets. So let's think about this conflict in terms of the contextual factors we discussed last week. First, is demographic environmental stress high? Yes, the population of that region has nearly doubled in the last 20 years, from around 450,000 in 1999 to just shy of 1 million in 2019. That's a 5.2% average annual population growth, which is almost twice as fast as population growth in Kenya as a country on average, and Kenya has been one of the fastest growing countries in the world over that time. And in terms of dependence on rural livelihoods, well, pastoralism is one of the most land, water, and animal-dependent livelihoods one could imagine. Okay, what about state capacity and legitimacy? For most of Kenya's independence, the Turkana region has been very lightly administered. These maps of road networks and cell phone coverage in Kenya help tell the story. With very little infrastructure and very little government presence, the Pokot and Turkana are largely left to their own devices and to manage their own conflicts. Finally, groupness is quite high. These two groups view each other with mistrust and do not have common ancestors or recognize common informal authorities like tribal elders as mutually legitimate. Despite these challenges, however, there is some cause for hope. In 2019, young men and elders from both tribes agreed to meet and try and broker a tenuous peace between the groups. What started out as a reconciliation process turned into an armed battle after the two conflicting communities resorted to a confrontation to settle their scores. <laughs> Members of the Turkana and Pokot communities had converged for a truce in a meeting organized by Turkana South Member of Parliament James Lomenen to resolve the acts of prolonged banditry in the area. <laughs> Minutes into the meeting, one agitated armed bandit from the Pokot community is said to have stormed into the meeting causing a pandemonium. He claimed that he could not reconcile with his council counterpart from the Turkana community as he was yet to return to him 20 of his goats he stole from his homestead last year. <laughs> His counterpart will also accuse him of being insincere as he had also refused to return 19 of his cows from the 27 he had stolen from him. An exchange of words will then follow, a move that sparked the intervention of Turkana leaders who dismissed the warriors from Pokot community. And it is here that things fell apart. The irate Pokot warriors then stormed back at the venue armed with guns creating a commotion. A shaken Turkana South member of parliament James Lomonen took to his heels and the meeting ended just as it started. It was a life threat and we were almost losing life. Both Pokot and Turkana, there was tension already. Even when we were handing it over, so, and uh, most of them were also drunk, yeah. So, uh, but I thank God uh, with what really happened, because even the reporters were there, the security were there, almost everybody. Now, ran. let's the turn to Sons of the Soil Complex. The Recall and, that Sons uh, of the Soil Complex are really conflicts between ethnic or religious groups them. that consider themselves no indigenous, the original issues. inhabitants of a given territory, and recent migrants from other regions of the country. Last time, I said indigenous, which implies being the original or native inhabitants of a place. I should have probably said the much harder to pronounce autonchthonous, which implies a historic tie to a location, but not necessarily indigenous identity. For example, the Kosa ethnic group in South Africa is not native to the eastern cape of South Africa. Kosas migrated to the region in the 11th century. But they are autonchthonous, especially with respect to the more recent migrants from the Netherlands and England that arrived in the 16th and 18th centuries. The Sri Lankan Civil War is the paradigmatic sons of the soil conflict and was one of the more brutal ethnic civil wars of the past 30 years, characterized by widespread use of suicide bombing, naval battles, and even air battles. It's a war that has lasted on and off for a quarter of a century. Not only on land, but also at sea. And the Tamil Tigers even became the first group of their kind to have an air force. As the years passed, it was a war fought with increasing ferocity. 
This was the violent anti-Tamil backlash after the Tamil Tigers killed 13 soldiers in an ambush in 1983. What had been a political campaign for a separate Tamil state now took a new direction. The rebel ranks swelled. By 1987, the war had reached a stage where India, with a large Tamil population of its own just across the narrow straits from Sri Lanka, intervened and sent in a peacekeeping force. The LTTE had set up the Black Tigers to carry out suicide attacks against political, economic and military targets, a blueprint for suicide bombings in the Middle East. It also had a special female squad called the Freedom Birds. India's role in the conflict was a disaster and had deadly consequences for Rajiv Gandhi, who was Prime Minister at the time the troops went in. He was killed at an election rally in 1991 by this female Tamil suicide bomber. Two years later, a suicide bombing claimed the life of Sri Lanka's then President Ranasinghe Pramadasa. The Tamil Tigers' ruthlessness, military style organization, and the level of conviction among their followers was now well established. Their recruits had to be ready to die for the cause and were issued with cyanide capsules to be swallowed if they were captured. The Tamil Tigers' supreme leader, Velupale Prabhakaran, speaking in 1995. Our people have lost patience, lost hope and reached the brink of utter frustration. They're not prepared to be tolerant any longer. The new government should come forward soon with a reasonable political framework that will satisfy the political aspirations of the Tamil people. This is our urgent and final appeal. If the new government rejects our urgent appeal, we will next year, in solidarity with our people, intensify our struggle for self-determination. In a new phase of the war, after Chandrika Kumaratunga became president, she herself was wounded in a bomb attack. And in 2001, the Tamil Tigers carried out perhaps their most audacious operation of all. This suicide attack on Colombo Airport destroyed half the Sri Lankan airline's fleet. The rebels were effectively running a shadow state in the north of the island nation with its own police force, courts, civil administration, bank and radio and television stations. And now, after nearly 20 years of conflict, came an important turning point. A ceasefire agreement mediated by Norway after the LTTE had dropped its demand for a separate state in favour of regional autonomy. Now, too, a split in the LTTE's own ranks, led by this man going by the nom de guerre of Colonel Karuna. Once a bodyguard of Velupale Prabhakaran, he led a revolt in the east of the island, charging that cadres from the region were not adequately represented in the Tamil Tigers hierarchy. After the ceasefire between the LTTE and the government finally broke down, the way was paved for the government offensive that saw the fall of the Tamil Tigers' de facto administrative capital, Kilinochi, in January this year. The rebels were soon fighting to hold on to an ever-shrinking amount of territory, but they still staged an air attack on Colombo, this plane plunging into an inland revenue office. Many thousands of Tamil civilians were trapped in the last battleground, though in time, more and more made their way across the front lines to crowded displacement camps. No humanitarian crisis, it seemed, was going to thwart the government's intention of finishing off the Tamil Tigers. Now, this video correctly categorizes the Tamil the movement as a separatist one, really with the ultimate aim the having been the greater regional autonomy, if not the outright national independence, of the Tamils from the Sri Lankan government in Colombo. But the root causes of the conflict extend much further back than 1983. Sri Lanka is an island nation in the Indian Ocean, separated from the Indian subcontinent by, at its narrowest point, just 10 miles. The British colonized Sri Lanka from 1815 to 1948, which was prized for its rich coffee and later tea and rubber plantations, as well as its attractive location for shipping and commerce in the Indian Ocean. Ethnically, Sri Lanka is composed of three main groups, the Sinhala, Indian Tamils, and Sri Lankan Tamils. The Indian Tamils were brought to the island to work in the plantations of the highlands of the Central South. Sri Lankan Tamils comprise about 24% of the population, concentrated mostly in the north and eastern parts of the country. The majority ethnic group, the Sinhala, traditionally lived in the highlands and the southern regions around the capital of Colombo. As was often done during the colonial era, the British relied heavily on the ethnic minority Tamils to staff the local civil service and elite positions within the economy. 
However, the movement against British colonial rule was a decidedly multi-ethnic one, with Tamils and Sinhalese joining forces under the banner of the Ceylon National Congress, which was founded in 1919. Following the Second World War, Sri Lanka won independence in 1948. The introduction of universal suffrage in the 1930s had already threatened to erode Tamil dominance of the government, but this process was sped up considerably in the 1940s and 50s. First, in 1949, the Gal Oya Development Board was created to address poverty and overpopulation in central and southern provinces, and began a process of relocating landless Sinhalese peasants to comparatively sparsely populated Tamil-dominated areas in the eastern province. This map shows you current population density, which is a pretty good reflection of historic population density. And as you can see, uh, traditional Sinhala homelands were much more densely populated than the Tamil regions. Then later in 1951, the Sinhalese Nationalist Sri Lankan Freedom Party was formed under a platform of making Sinhalese the official language and extending Sinhalese authority into Tamil-dominated regions. That party's win in 1956 led to a purge of Tamils from the civil service and an acceleration of in-migration of Sinhalese peoples into Tamil lands. As you learn from the readings, things really began coming to a head in the 1960s, as rioting between ethnic Sinhalese and Tamils in the eastern province began to overwhelm local police forces. In response, the Sinhalese-dominated military stationed in the region took on the role of protecting Sinhala communities, clearly taking sides in the conflict. Against this backdrop, ethnic militias began to form, ostensibly for self-protection, at least at first. By the 1970s, persistent ethnic rioting and perceived bias of state forces had caused large-scale displacement of Tamils to the Jaffna Peninsula, the far north of the country that would become the epicenter of the eventual rebellion. In 1976, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam, or the Tamil Tigers, had formed, and began a campaign to end Sinhala influence over the Tamil homeland. That essentially brings us up to where the earlier BBC video began. An LTT ambush on the Sinhalese military led to the Black July riots, which killed 400 to 3,000 Tamils and rendered 150,000 Sri Lankans homeless. It also began the war in earnest. That war would not end until 1983, when the Sri Lankan government won a decisive military victory, at the cost of countless civilian lives caught in the crossfire. Ten years hasn't diminished the grief for the survivors of Sri Lanka's civil war. Thousands of Tamil civilians were trapped on this strip of land as government forces and the liberation tigers of Tamil Elam fought out the last weeks of the war. Nyana Silan Rahini was eight months old at the time. She was found sucking milk from her dead mother's breast. The UN estimates that 40,000 civilians were killed in the last few months of the fighting as the government launched its final assault on LTTE fighters. Today, 10 years on, there are still families here waiting for the government to tell them what has happened to thousands of fathers and sons and mothers and daughters who went missing during the conflict. Kadil Kamanadan Kukilavani's 18-year-old son disappeared after he walked into a military-controlled area trying to escape the fighting. No one has told her what happened to him. It's too painful for us even to step foot in this place. No one understands the suffering and pain from losing our loved ones. It's unbearable to be here. Tamils started fighting in 1983 for a homeland because they felt marginalised by governments dominated by Sinhala Buddhist interests. Ten years after the war, many Tamils feel little has improved. If you are a government that fundamentally uh, has as your uh, electoral voter base uh, a singular Buddhist uh, voter base uh, that works on this narrative that Sri Lanka is a singular Buddhist country and that no one else must be uh, allowed to stake claim to any part of it, uh, then you have to uh, keep cheating the Tamils. After the war, you we will discuss this case in greater detail in class, but it's important to recognize that while land was clearly important in this conflict, there were other aspects of national policy at stake as well. We'll discuss the relative balance of these factors and how much they contributed to the outbreak of conflict in class. But several of the contextual factors were clearly present. Groupness was high, state capacity, especially in the Tamil region, was comparatively low, and land was increasingly valuable and scarce due to population growth and demographic pressures in the southern part of the country. Lastly, we come to conflict to prevent environmental degradation. 
These conflicts tend to be between resource users with long-standing relationships with the local environment and more recent arrivals who wish to use that environment for different purposes, imposing costs on the legacy users. Legacy here meaning users who have a long-standing relationship with the resource. The example we used last week was oil exploitation in Nigeria's Niger Delta, which is generating massive economic resources, but also imposing highly localized costs on residents in the Delta, who see a comparatively small share of the benefits. This time, we'll discuss conflict over the Brazilian Amazon. Now, the Amazon provides massive ecosystem services, not just to Brazil and the people who inhabit it, but to all of us. The Amazon's rainforest ecosystem provides as much as $8.2 billion to Brazil's economy on an annual basis, but that doesn't even begin to capture the global public good it provides in terms of carbon sequestration, the storage of carbon dioxide or other forms of carbon to either mitigate or defer global warming and avoid dangerous climate change. The carbon is literally in the wood. For communities who have historic ties to the Amazon, its value is even greater, but not all resource users see the Amazon the same way. The Amazon makes up the world's largest rainforest, of which 60% is in Brazil. The Amazon contains 10% of the world's biodiversity and is crucial in the stability of the global climate. It is also home to a significant indigenous population that have long been the stewards of the forest. Under President Bolsonaro's policies, deforestation rates, already on the rise, could increase drastically. O Brasil não suporta ter mais de 50% do seu território demarcado como terra indígena, juntamente com a área de proteção ambiental, com parques nacionais e essas reservas todas atrapalham o desenvolvimento. As pessoas têm primeiro lugar. A DBR de 19, né? Isso é mais agora a gente preocupa mais, porque ali vai chegar muita coisa. É, eu quero falar diretamente ruim para a terra indígena. For the indigenous population already under threat, loss of protection could lead to an increase in violence, conflict, and the exploration of their land for commercial interests. Eu estou aqui com medo fazendo essa entrevista de ter alguém aqui querendo fazer algo comigo, coisa que não é boa. We are at the intersection of the Amazon River and Rio Negro, and we can see the convergence of the two in the waters here behind me. The rivers are like the roads of the Amazon, allowing for the establishment of communities and as a means of transportation. But the highways in the Amazon are hastening deforestation by easing access for cattle ranchers, farmers, and mining. Now, when highways are built near indigenous areas, this puts them in conflict with the deforesters that are... I'm a research professor at INPA, the National Institute for Research in Amazonia in Manaus, Brazil. I've been uh, in the Amazon for 43 years. There's been an area larger than France deforested. While I've been here, the, the size of the Brazilian Amazon is approximately the size of Western Europe. Certainly biodiversity is a global issue. Uh, but climate change is something that affects people directly. The BR319 highway uh, connects Manaus in the center of the Amazon to Rondonia, Porto Velho, which is in what's called the arc of deforestation. And with these highways that connect that to the center of the Amazon, all of those deforesters and their, their processes will move in and continue from here. The regulation in Brazil is that any indigenous people within 40 kilometers of one of these projects is supposed to be consulted. The Amazon forest is important for many reasons. It's certainly very important to the people who live here. Uh, the traditional peoples all depend on the forest for virtually everything. Brazil's indigenous population is currently protected by law. The 1988 constitution aimed to correct the previous decades of violence and the discrimination they experienced. It recognized indigenous people have fundamental rights to not assimilate. Indigenous territories would also be granted land use or demarcated according to their traditional use of the land. The demarcation process is ongoing, but Bolsonaro argues that indigenous territory is too large, hindering development. Currently, about 12.5% of Brazil is demarcated. Indigenous communities have gathered in protest over the new government's policies and concern over Bolsonaro's rhetoric. 
A spokesperson for the government told us that nothing will be done that is not in total agreement with the laws and constitution. I'm working here with Marcia, a Brazilian journalist. Quais que são os, os desafios, se a gente puder assim apontar, é, dos povos indígenas hoje, em 2019? Márcia, hoje a grande preocupação dos povos indígenas é a continuidade da demarcação dos seus territórios. Sem a demarcação, o índio não tem saúde, o índio não tem educação, o índio não tem cultura, o índio morre. E na 319, os tanharinhos, os, os parintintim ali, né, outros povos indígenas sendo ameaçados. Isso, o governo tem que sentar para discutir isso com os povos indígenas. Ele não pode tomar decisões lá no gabinete dele só porque ele é presidente. Ele não é o Tsurá, ele não é o deuso. Ele tem que respeitar. A Constituição Federal é lei. Então esse momento é um momento crítico para nós povos indígenas porque o governo não está nos ouvindo. We're traveling to Humaita, a hotspot for deforestation in the Amazon, to see what's at stake in the area. There's no easy way from Manaus to Humaita. The road B319 is unpaved. Plus we're in the rainy season, so that equals an impassable amount of mud. Instead, we're going to fly to Porto Velo. And from there, it's a long drive. The BR319 was built in the 1970s, but later abandoned. The state government needs the support of the federal government to pave the section between Manaus and Humaita. However, Bolsonaro has not included the BR319 in the current highway investment budget. Humaita sits close to some of the greatest areas of deforestation. The Humaita offices of Brazilian's Environmental Protection Agency, Ibama, was burned down in 2017 and has not been rebuilt. Ibama and local authorities suspect the arson was connected to illegal mining operations. Since then, neither Ibama or ECMB has had a presence here in this area. There's a lot of tension, and we've been advised to travel with security and keep on the move. After Bolsonaro took office, he moved the demarcation of indigenous lands from the National Indian Foundation, FUNAI, to the Ministry of Agriculture. The government says this was done to centralize officers, but the act raised concerns amongst groups, including the indigenous communities, international governments, and the UN. Fernanda is with a public policy NGO in Amazonas. Atualmente, nós temos uma grande influência dos fatores políticos na conservação da floresta. Então, é, atualmente o Brasil vive um momento de instabilidade na, nas, com as questões ambientais. A gente tem diversas terras indígenas sendo invadidas por grileiros, madeireiros, então pessoas que exploram recursos dessas terras indígenas. E existe um enfraquecimento dos órgãos federais, né, que são responsáveis por proteger essas áreas. Bom, no território amazônico, as terras indígenas Elas são áreas protegidas muito importantes. Elas garantem a conservação da floresta, da, da vida, da água. Em todos esses territórios, a gente tem diversos estudos que, que, que mostram, evidenciam que dentro das terras indígenas acontece muito menos desmatamento do que fora delas. Driving on this road is a little bit like mud wrestling in a 4x4. On this road we could easily get stuck in the mud and with no cell service there's no one to call for help. In the Brazilian Amazon lives over 900,000 indigenous people in 471 recognized communities, of which 100 are uncontacted or isolated. We're visiting the Nova de Janeiro community who live close to the BR319 and are told they will be consulted on the road. Como vai vai passar a, a, a BR 319, vai aumentar o, o número de pessoas em Humaitá, vai aumentar a demanda do, nos hospitais, até a própria produ, produção aqui a gente não vai ser muito valorizado porque eles vão estar exportando muito de fora para cá, entendeu? Então a gente vê isso com muita preocupação. Ah, a floresta é nossa vida, né? Nossa terra. Daqui nós, é, nós temos antepassados enterrados, nós temos toda uma tradição, toda uma cultura aí que vem passando de gerações para gerações, né? E ela é tudo pra gente. Se não fosse ela, a gente não existiria, né? Como você vê o desmatamento? 
E a floresta em si é como se fosse o pulmão de todo o planeta, entendeu? Cada vez que você vai desmatando mais, cada vez ele vai trabalhando mais com força, vai sobrecarregando ela e vai chegar um tempo que ela não vai resistir, né? We're taking a boat to visit the area this community uses for hunting and gathering. As the non-indigenous population encroaches, they have to travel further into the forest to find what they need. We sailed for about 40 minutes and now we're in pristine Amazon forest. Ela tira o óleo, tira o óleo, é a copaíba né, que faz, que faz remédio, faz, faz muita coisa, né? shampoo, aí a gente pega, tira, fura com trado, Aí eu paro o óleo dela aqui. Aí dá pouco, dá dois litros, dá um litro, às vezes não dá nada. Sim, hoje nós estamos aqui morando, né? É, como uma comunidade unida, trabalhando, né? Ocupando a nossa reserva, que é a nossa mesmo, entendeu? E trabalhando como, como plantivo, né? E nós temos castanhas também, açaí, entendeu? E muito produtivo que a gente faz assim na coletiva de roça. Onde seja plantada é, mandioca, banana, né? E várias outras coisas de, que são é naturais, né? Que tem outra tradicional que a gente, muito tempo passado, né? Do povo parintitim, que a gente também não está deixando é, esquecer. Tá? Do DBR de 319, né? Isso é mais, agora a gente preocupa mais, porque ali vai chegar muita coisa... É, eu quero falar diretamente ruim para a terra indígena, porque vai entrar muita gente estranha que não sabe onde é a limitada da terra indígena e pode chegar a querer ocupar a nossa terra. E aí vai trazer o quê? Doença e um, poluição de água do rio. A gente não somos contra na, nenhum, nenhum desenvolvimento do país, não somos contra o um empreendimento, mas a gente quer que faça ser feito do modo certo e os nossos direitos também sejam sejam feitos, entendeu? In Brazil, these people are very vulnerable since the discovery of uh, like this because it's not a discovery of Brazil and America. Uh, you have a process of uh, we can say um, destruction. O empreendimento de uma estrada gera outras estradas, gera ramais que são impactos daquela estrada. Onde se passam as estradas é onde estão os maiores desmatamentos. A pergunta que fica é, se o Estado não consegue conter o desmatamento nessas áreas, no modelo atual de governança, o que garante que o Estado vai conseguir conter esse desmatamento numa nova abertura de BR? O próprio discurso né, do, do, às vezes, de certos agentes do governo já estão estimulando as invasões. Pode ter certeza, se eu chegar lá, não vai ter dinheiro para ONG, não vai ter um centímetro demarcado para a reserva indígena ou para quilombola. É um exemplo claro aqui. O índio é um ser humano igual nós, vocês estão vendo um aqui. Não podemos deixá-lo dentro de uma reserva indígena como se fosse um animal no zoológico. According to CIMI, an indigenous advocacy group, at least six communities in Brazil have been threatened this year, including illegal use of the land and violence. Se o governo ele nos compara como animais presos no zoológico, nós não nos vemos dessa forma. Paving roads like the PR319 will increase access, but it's not just about the main road. There's all the offshoots that will increase accessibility, and with that, deforestation. Vila Realidade is the last settlement before we reach an undrivable part of the BR319. The population has grown over the last few years from 1,000 to 7,000. Eu vim do estado de Rondônia, certo? E como a gente é evangélico, o senhor me mostrou num sonho esse lugar. E aí eu vim, 
através de outra pessoa me indicou que aqui existia esse local, eu vim. Aí, aí vi a terra que eu tinha visto em sonho e procurei saber o dono, o dono vendia e eu comprei. É, porque a gente tinha aí uns 400 cabelos de gado e a pastagem era pouca, né? Então a gente lutou para tirar a licença e eles não deram licença. E a gente derrubou um trecho aí, né? Aí eles multaram, porque a gente derrubou sem licença. E aí não tinha um pasto suficiente e vendeu o gado. Aí agora com multa você não pode fazer um financiamento, você não pode fazer nada. Fica travado tudo, né? As pessoas têm em primeiro lugar. E aqui é um estado rico que pode andar com as pernas dela, entendeu? E tá tudo travado. Não precisa vir as coisas, o alimento de fora num no, no estado rico desse. Então tá faltando apoio. Que se o povo apoiar, os governantes apoiar, esse lugar aqui, a Amazônia, não precisa trazer nada de fora. Ela pode exportar para fora, não trazer. Nick Aaron has been kind enough to show us around his farm. He's got more than 800 hectares, so clearly we haven't seen all of it. We've seen where he keeps his cattle, some of the fruit plantation, and a lot of the land is also still the original forest. However, he did clear land before receiving a license to do so, and then got fined, and then after that he stopped clearing any more land. I think that this new government will understand that this is something that no one pays. Entendeu? Ninguém paga, porque eles, é, dá de entender que eles multam as pessoas, multavam assim, para assustar a pessoa mesmo, para a pessoa não fazer mais, aí parar tudo. Much of the deforestation happening in Brazil's Amazon is illegal, and there's not much accountability. In 2018, more than 2 billion US dollars in fines were forgiven. In Brazil in general, and for the indigenous communities in particular, poverty and income inequity levels remain very high. We have to preserve the nature, that we have to preserve uh, the Amazonas, but I have to, uh, to guarantee the economic and social development for the people who live here. We have 97% of the Amazon conservated, preserved. Uh, we have a, a, a very hard work to do that and we are paying a price, a price, a high price for that because uh, a half of our people are poor and we cannot accept that. We're gonna uh, go on preserving the nature but uh, we have to, to have some compensation for that, for, for, for this preservation we maintain here. But, but we need the help of the Brazilian government we need the, uh, the help of international uh, institutions. Uh, these institutions and the world must understand the importance of to, to, to preserve the, the Amazon. If we had a road, a paved road, we're gonna have connected to the rest of the country, we're gonna connect to, to the rest of the world. I think that many people uh, get this speech extremely that the president is against the preservation. I don't see things this way. Uh, even because here in the Amazon the people wouldn't permit this, all the world wouldn't permit. The people we spoke to here expressed similar goals to live independently and use the forest as a resource. However, the ideas and policies for achieving this are not exactly aligned. Nós queremos desenvolvimento. Sim, queremos, por que não? Mas não a qualquer custo, não de goela abaixo. Respeita os povos indígenas que são os verdadeiros brasileiros desse país. É isso que a gente pede. My dream is to guarantee the preservation of the Amazonas and get social development. The floresta vai se regenerar, mas os habitantes que que habitam no planeta não, então Reflecting on the Amazon case, how does it stack up in terms of the contextual factors we've been discussing? And does this help, or not, us understand why this conflict has not resulted, at least not yet, in large-scale violence? We'll discuss in class.